Good evening and welcome to tonight's forum on participation and politics online. It's a great joy to be here. Uh, my name is Susan Crawford. I'm the founder of One Web Day and a law professor right now visiting at the University of, uh, actually at Yale, and I'll be at the University of Michigan in a few weeks. Um, I am so pleased to be here, and it's thanks to the Information Law Institute here at NYU Law School and the hard work of Elizabeth Stark and Nicole Arts that gets us here. Thank you very much to them for hosting this event, which I am confident will be stimulating, challenging, provocative, and brief, all of those things at once. Um, also thanks to the Internet Society and its chapter here in New York, who has been a co-sponsor of this event and uh, deeply involved in making the Internet a better place for all of us. So, in the last 10 years, the Internet has uh, grown from something used by a bunch of uh, guys with long white beards in um, homogenous universities to a general communications infrastructure that's necessary for each one of us for each day. And that's the way most introductions start to panels like this. The transformative power of the Internet, uh, its life-changing um, effects on all of us and its importance to daily life. And a lot of books and articles get to this, raise a lot of provocative questions, and then stop and say, now what? You know, now what do we do? And I started One Web Day because I had a lot of deep concerns about the now what. There are actually lots of incumbents around the world, gatekeepers of various kinds in law enforcement and the content industry and the network operators, we used to call them telephone companies, but they're now network operators, who have a lot of power over the internet and have lots of incentives to constrain it in various ways that might not be good for us as a society. And I have a strong conviction that we shouldn't take the internet for granted as central as it has become to our lives. I wanted us to be able to rise up when negative internet policies were being created around the world and be a global constituency that cared about the future of the internet. This is the third year of One Web Day around the world, it's celebrated each September 22nd. And the theme this year is online participatory democracy, uh, which is why we're so happy to be involved in this panel tonight, and the importance of the internet to participation and the importance of keeping the internet free and open and interoperable so that participation is easy for everyone around the world. One Web Day is yours. I give it to you absolutely. It's my gift to you. It's a platform, an Earth Day for the internet to use for your own purposes to focus attention on the importance of the internet to politics, on uh, local issues of internet concern like censorship and connectivity and skills. Um, and my goal, again, is to help us create a global constituency that cares about these issues. My call to action tonight for One Web Day is that we're looking for 100 ambassadors for the 100 days before One Web Day to spread news about One Web Day to their networks, their communities, talking about issues that they care about and tying them to the One Web Day themes. So welcome to One Web Day 2008 coming up in September 22nd. We'll be in Washington Square at noon for the New York version of One Web Day. And we'll try to answer that question, now what? Because that's up to all of us. And speaking of now what, I'm delighted to introduce Alison Fine, who will be our uh, facilitator, moderator, but she's really much more than that uh, tonight. Um, she's the author of an award-winning book, Momentum, Igniting Social Change in the Connected Age. She's a senior fellow at Demos, which is a think tank here in New York. And she's a senior editor at the Personal Democracy Forum. Big plug for the Personal Democracy Forum coming right up here in New York on June 23rd through June, June 24th. We have a central, wonderful event. I wish I could be there, and it's going to be huge. Um, Allison just wrote a paper commissioned by the Case Foundation called Social Citizens Beta on Young People Using Social Media for Social Change. So with great joy, I introduce Allison Fine. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Susan is a, a dear old friend, a dear longtime friend, I should say, and, and uh, I am really delighted to be here. I have to tell you, I'm, I'm more than delighted to be here because yesterday I was speaking at a conference on corporate philanthropy, which, as you can imagine, started right on time. And I spoke and did my heartfelt best. And at the end, as a thank you, the organizer came up and said, we have a special gift for you. We've had someone here 
who has been drawing a caricature. Now, if there's anything you don't want to see after you have been up speaking and wondering how you're looking, it's a caricature exaggerating your very worst flaws and fears. <laughs> it was horrific, and they made me share it with the entire room of participants. You look to be a much friendlier group than that. <laughs> and, and Well, that was New York, too, and I'm assuming I don't mind video at all. Feel free to take pictures. Feel free to blog or vlog or whatever other og that you want to do. But please don't draw me today, OK? Here's what we're going to do. We have an august panel of very interesting folks here. And I am going to take the great opportunity to uh, ask them some questions. We're going to have a conversation. And then we're going to have plenty of time for uh, uh, people to ask questions as well. And then I believe there's a reception uh, afterwards. So why don't we just begin? And I was thinking today, on this great day in American history, we ought to start with an African-American man, don't you think? Isn't that fitting for today? <laughs> I'd like to introduce Baratunde Thurston. Baratunde is a comedian and blogger. He's the web editor of The Onion. He writes at Boston's Weekly Dig and Huffington Post. <clears throat> he has written three books, the most recent of which is Thank you, Congressional Pages, for being so damn sexy. <laughs> Should have brought that tonight. So. I didn't know you were going to mention that. I can't help it. I'm in charge. So, you've written, Baratunde, that the media was ill-prepared to moderate discussions on race during the primary season. What do you think they could have done to facilitate a better conversation, and could that have used social media? Sure. The, uh, first, let me add on a bit to the introduction. This is part of Internet Week, mm -hmm. correct? And I just, I'm happy that there's finally a week to promote the existence of the Internet. A lot of people didn't know about it. Maybe we could send letters to folks and let them know <laughs> that there's places they can get information or videos or music or whatever. Um, the other part of my bio that's pretty relevant to this really isn't the onion side, which doesn't care too much for democracy, but it's the Jack and Jill politics side. I'm one of the co-founders of a black political website called Jack and Jill Politics, and we've been highly productive and somewhat visible during this campaign. And a lot of my answers are going to come from being a part of that community Great. rather than some of the other things. Um, as far as the media being ill-prepared to moderated discussion of race and kind of what can they do or what could they have done, really just go out of business. Um, they're in the way. Mm -hmm. They're in the way and in many ways their business model doesn't allow for the type of conversation that we need to happen. I'll give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. I was watching the night of the Pennsylvania primaries, CNN, the America's most trusted name <laughs> in BS. And they had uh, John King was out there having a, too much fun with his freaking maps. And Soledad O'Brien and uh, another guy who I don't remember because a lot of them look the same mm -hmm. were looking at these fancy bar charts. And it was like 3D for no reason. You know, it was just a simple bar chart showing like, how did white men vote? And they showed white women voting. They said, well, white women clearly voted their gender. Let's see how white men vote. Will they vote their race or their gender? <laughs> and then they had the magical 3D chart. Looks like they voted their race tonight. <laughs> Come, like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like, there are other bigoted things you could vote on besides race and gender, first of all. And second of all, you're, they're oversimplifying the voter to a dramatic and dis disgusting and depressing degree. And that's the level of conversation that's being injected into living rooms and households and airport lounges across the country. And it's painful to watch that. When you look at a conversation about Reverend Wright, and you have this group of people who are mostly millionaires deciding, mostly white, mostly millionaires, mostly living in the same cities, going to the same schools and the same clubs, that this is fringe behavior, that this is un-American, that this is unpatriotic, they don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. They don't have the life experience, and they don't have the incentive to find out and so they just go with what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And they've got hours and hours to fill while they wait for results to come back and nothing to say. Mm -hmm. And every incentive to say something inflammatory, something full of conflict, something crazy to drive up those ratings and keep people coming back. So they're ill-prepared, and I think it's dangerous the way that they're ill-prepared because people are much more complex 
then the way they're portrayed, these stories have a lot more nuance than the ways that they've been willing to show. Mm -hmm. and, and how, but how would you like to see this conversation take place? Where, do, where does it need to take place and how? I think the conversation is taking place. And I think social media has a role as well as just real life has a role. But the greatest gift I had during the season was actually getting away from the computer mm. and going to people's houses, like door to door, asking them questions. Because when you're at somebody's house, you can't scream at them. Like, you're wrong, your candidate sucks. Like, that doesn't get your message across effectively. <laughs> you have to listen. You have to assume that they kind of know what they're talking about. And most of the times you find out that that's the case. Mm -hmm. I think for these companies, their strength is still massive distribution and promotion capability. They think they know everything and they think they have to say what they know and they don't. But there are a lot of stories that are out there. There are, there are good stories on YouTube. There are great photos on Flickr. And I think in the way that the telcos have feared becoming a dumb pipe, that some of these big media companies should just realize that actually being a dumb pipe's all right. Like they've already got the dumb nail. <laughs> Worry about the pipe. Worry about the pipe. Worry about the pipe. Because we do have an explosion of all kinds of stories and we still need someone to help us find them. Mm -hmm. We need somebody, some kind of editing function, some kind of curating function. I think they can play a role in that. Mm -hmm. But they have shown themselves incapable of playing that role of actual journalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, and it has, it's very limited. It doesn't, race is the latest thing, but I wouldn't expect some complex understanding of the black community and black churches from the same organization that couldn't lead us or help not lead us into war. Mm -hmm. It's the same people. And there were just basic skills that were lacking. So in many ways, I don't look to them for the answer. I see the answer coming up in other places, and I'm encouraged by that. Okay. And maybe these guys will get it, and maybe they won't, but I'm not waiting for them. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have somebody who wants to weigh in on this. Let me introduce <laughs> you to Jay Rosen. I'm sure many of you uh, here know him. He's a professor of journalism here at NYU and the author of Press Think, uh, a blog about journalism and its ordeals. He blogs at the Huffington Post also, and in 2006 created newassignment.net, an experimental site for open source reporting projects, one of which is off the bus on Huffington Post. Jay, do you want to tell us about this experiment and how it's been working this campaign season? Uh, sure, I'd love to. Uh, first of all, thanks for organizing this. Thanks for, for coming. Um, I like, my method of studying the press is to force people to deal with my ideas and then see what they say and get a response and then the response reveals a lot of what I'm looking for. So in this project, uh, which is offthebus.net, uh, the idea that we were trying to test was uh, simply to involve many more people in campaign journalism uh, and increase participation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one source or origin for the project was my own frustration as a press critic with basically making the same critique every four years or every cycle, as they say, in the uh, business of politics. Uh, basically, going back to 1988, I had, along with many other people, including many journalists, expressed various dissatisfactions with many of the things that you were just saying. The horse race model of coverage, the, um, the uh, sort of lurid and sensationalized approach to politics that is taken on television, the, um, the punditry of the insider, uh, or what Todd Gitlin, my friend Todd Gitlin, called um, the, uh, the approach where you, you try to create the cognoscente of our own bamboozlement, where we are brought inside the image making and manipulation process as if that itself had some sort of value. And I had basically been writing that critique for uh, 20 years until the internet. <laughs> and the internet changed uh, the situation simply by dropping the cost of participation and of publishing to the point where you could try to solve the problem of better campaign coverage by throwing people at it. So that was the idea of Off the Bus, is could we engage lots of people in the coverage of the campaign? And we had a couple of ideas there. One was that instead of sending people on the campaign trail, on the campaign bus, why don't you just leave them where they are in American life? And when the campaign comes by them, they are your correspondent. Right? 
So that was one of the ideas of Off the Bus, was if we could involve, involve enough people, we could still catch up to the campaign in all these different ways, and we wouldn't try to make insiders out of amateurs or citizen journalists, but instead leave them where they are, allow them to remain within politics, to have views, to have candidates, to have votes, to have political lives, and still report on the campaign. The other thing we were trying to do was figure out whether you could um, involve lots of people in reporting projects and get the benefits of participation in a sort of open source, distributed way. And third, I wanted to make sure that if we produce something with this method, that we could get it noticed and get it visible and get it distributed. And so that was the alliance with the Huffington Post came from that. They had a very popular existing website. It was very interested in politics. It already had a user base that was interested in what we were doing. It was a natural partner. And Ariana Huffington herself got the project and, and felt it was perfect for what they were trying to do, which is create what they now call an internet newspaper as opposed to a newspaper on the internet. So what I have to report now is that we're at this very interesting midpoint in this experiment. It takes a while to figure out how to do what you say you're going to do with these projects. It takes a while to figure out um, which parts of your idea made no sense at all and adjust to the actual participants you, we have. So we're at a kind of midpoint where things are starting to gel and take off. And the signs of that are as follows. One, we have what are called super contributors emerging, meaning people who are very into what we're doing and are devoting a lot of time to it. And the, the best known is Mayhill Fowler, who has herself injected herself into the campaign a couple of times through her reports. But actually, there are others as well. And they're starting to claim beats and become sort of regular contributors. Secondly, and anybody who knows open source projects knows how important this is, some of the more involved contributors are beginning to absorb the costs of other participants. And so we can scale the project because some of our more dedicated people are willing to organize other volunteers. And that allows us to actually engage a lot more. So we didn't have that for the first year or so, but now we do, or half year. Uh, we're getting there. Um, we're also developing our own operating style. So the story that emerged this week where Bill Crenton ranted at um, Vanity Fair for its terrible profile was caught by Mayhill Fowler of Off the Bus, and she was in the rope line. And so part of our operating style is we're extending the news space to places where citizens go and reporting on the campaign from there, not just where the spotlight of the professional press <coughs> is. And that's part of our operating style. Um, along with other projects which are distributed information gathering, meaning hundreds of people working on one story or one feature. So we had several hundred people cooperate to, to create a um, super delegate biographical biography project where we had profiles and interviews and news stories about every single super delegate um, created by off the bus volunteers. So those are two points of our operating style. Um, and we are proving that we, our original idea that if something emerges from this network of contributors, we can get it in to the campaign conversation through the Huffington Post has proven to work. That works. Mm. Things get their front page on the, the Huffington Post, get to the rest of the news bloodstream if they're uh, important. So uh, we're at the point where we're starting to see these things emerge that tell us our project is working. And we have from now till November to show that you can actually do a different kind of campaign journalism using these kinds of tools. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. Well, let me ask you this, because I mean, clearly the off-the-bus contributors have a different vantage point of mm -hmm. the campaign, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes a different access point as well. Do you think though that they're changing the horse race nature of the conversation? Uh, no. No, that's a tough one, isn't it? It's like asking people not to look at a picture of Paris Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't think that anything we've done is disruptive enough, powerful enough, better enough to um, dislodge this thing, mm -hmm. the horse race narrative that I've been ranting against since 1988. But the reason for that 
is that we're early in this process. And the other reason for it is that um, the horse race narrative exists because it solves a particular problem for the mainstream media, not because it produces good coverage. And the problem that it solves is how do you immerse yourself in politics without claiming any political identity at all? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. It's actually a very hard thing to do. Most people who immerse, them, immerse themselves in politics begin to care about it. You know, it's like natural to do that. But if you're a professional reporter, you have to somehow be totally immersed and yet still without a political identity or commitment yourself. Well, the, the horse race and this kind of, this angle of politics in which we become connoisseurs of our own bamboozlement <laughs> and experts on the process is the best way of solving that problem. And because nobody's come up with a better way, the horse race narrative goes on, but not because it produces good coverage, but because it produces press innocence. Mm. That's terrific. I'm, I wrote down connoisseurs of our own bamboozlement, but I don't know how to spell connoisseurs, so I just made it like C-O-N. <laughs> That's actually Todd Gitlin's phrase. I wish I could take credit I for I think it. you could. I, I wouldn't yeah. know. But thank you. That's, that's really interesting. I want to bring into this conversation a very special friend who's been waiting very patiently at the end, Andrew Roche, who is the founder of the Personal Democracy Forum, as Susan mentioned, and the co-founder of Tech President. If you haven't seen this website and uh, daily blog, you, you need to. It's an award-winning group blog covering uh, the 2008 presidential campaign. Andrew started Mouse, an educational nonprofit, in 1997, and he's a senior technology advisor for the Sunlight Foundation. In addition, he and I are two of the four editors, including Micha Sifri and uh, Joshua Levy, who have an anthology of essays coming out in um, coordination with the PDF conference on democracy in the 21st century, as Susan has an essay in that collection. Our friend Clay Shirky in the back. Wave your hand, Clay. Clay. The author of Here Comes Everybody uh, has an essay as well. It's going to be a terrific fun. Andrew, I know that you are a great proponent of wisdom of the crowds. But let me ask you this, it, what is the tension between wisdom of the crowds and protecting minority views in the future of our democracy? Well, I think that the, the potential of minorities to be able to protect their own views using these tools is probably the biggest opportunity. Mm. Um, I always like to say that organized minorities are always more powerful than disorganized majorities. And we're seeing a, a, a fundamental shift happening. And, and um, I, uh, I agree with Jay that there hasn't been much change in the media landscape over the last, uh, over the last two or three years of, of watching politics and media uh, interact in the 21st century. Um, but I actually think that the battle's happening in another way, um, and that we are actually starting to hold our uh, media companies and their punditry and fake pund uh, objective punditry uh, to account. Um, about uh, Americans apparently, from the latest numbers I saw, watch about 14 hours of television a week. They also watch, they also are online apparently 14 hours uh, a week as well. Um, that's not good news for the major media companies that try to broadcast opinions to us through talking heads. Um, but the reason why there's a fundamental shift happening is that Political opinion forms in our country the same way it forms around all kinds of other things, by people talking to each other. If a friend recommends a movie to you or a restaurant to you, chances are you're going to remember it, you'll probably go. You're certainly going to go or remember it more clearly than if you read the review of the restaurant or the movie in the newspaper. And certainly more likely to go if you saw the advertisement for the restaurant or the or the movie. Same thing happens in politics. People talk to each other. And political, opinions gets, political opinion gets formed either around a water cooler, around a dining room table, um, over the back fence, at the market, at the school board meeting. People talk to each other and they impress each other with their ideas and they help form political opinion. That's happening now in this election as much as it has in any other election except that it's been put on steroids because we have these amazing tools that allow people to communicate in new ways with what we like to call a tech president voter-generated content. 
And voter generated content for most people was, well, you know, the Barack Obama girl video or um, the Yes We Can video or any of the ones that the mainstream media may put on television that get massive amounts of views on YouTube. But when my 81 year old dad is emailing 15 of his friends with a now link. Now let him wave his hand, Andrew. Come on. He's here. here. <laughs> um, when he's emailing 15 of his friends with a link to a YouTube video of Barack Obama's speech on race or his Iowa speech, acceptance speech, or some email internet thing that came out either for or against Barack, he's sharing his opinion. He's, that's a piece of voter generated content. And that dynamic, that, that uh, facility uh, multiplied tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times outside of the mainstream media landscape, even though much of the information is coming from some of the major media companies, is seriously changing the media ecology and challenging the power of our political media uh, enterprises as well as the political parties and the candidates themselves. And so one of the reasons why the Barack Obama campaign is an interesting study, regardless of whether or not you support him politically or not, is that they have learned, and they've learned very quickly, that they are not just a campaign, they are actually a media operation. And they know that if they publish as much information as, rel as quickly as it's available, and, as and often in real time, and put it out on the internet, that their supporters are going to distribute it for them. The Barack Obama speech on race has been viewed s over seven million times on YouTube. That's not counting how many times it's been viewed on w a very other kinds of sites like media sites that have archives of it. For, you for a YouTube video to be counted as a view, you have to watch the whole thing. The average YouTube video is watched for a minute and a half. If you have seven million people watching a 37, million video, uh, a 37 minute video on race and they're sending it to each other, we are going from the era of the sound bite to the era, era of the sound blast. And not only are the candidates learning about this, but individuals are learning about this. And they are producing their own versions of political opinion just the same way that pamphleteers did 200 years ago and not necessarily putting their names on it. But as is the case with the wisdom of crowds, if a piece of content is compelling, people will read it, people will watch it, but more importantly, they'll start to vet it and they'll start checking to see whether it's true. And if, the, if it's anonymous, the chances of it being accepted by a larger group is probably less, but it doesn't necessarily make it less powerful. There's another dynamic though that I think is important to note in relation to Jay's work and your comments about the mainstream media and how they fail to understand race or frankly a lot of other detailed complicated subjects because it's almost everything you said you just remove race and put in healthcare or education and they say the same stupid things. The, um, how many people in the audience know how to edit video? Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. Most audiences I will tell you there's only two or three people. So I will argue that this audience is the majority of you are viterate. And viteracy is the ability to understand and to be able to create complex ideas using video and be able to distribute them regardless of what platform, whether it's television, the internet, mobile, or any other upcoming device. And so we are a society that for a great deal of time focused on text as a primary means of communicating ideas and it's still extremely important and extremely valuable and very detail oriented. But video is starting to become a very powerful medium in its own right in the hands of auteurs who know how to use it. And that video uh, capability as well as the various platforms that are available for that video to be distributed is posing a fundamental challenge to the power structures of our political system that were controlled by the mainstream media and the political parties for so many years. So I'm optimistic that we, uh, yes, we are at the beginning of this. It was said that the British Navy took 150 years to install lime juice on their ships after it was discovered that lime juice presents scurvy. So hopefully we'll be a little bit faster than that. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about here the, 
the, the battle between the democracy of the 20th century and the democracy of the 21st. And there are those who believe that this technology will continue to provide power for top-down politics, which is one school of thought. And there's another school which, um, which Jay represents and I represent and I believe many of you represent, which is the school that believes that this technology creates a more robust and participatory democracy. Mm -hmm and that we will be able to use this to, to re-engage our citizenry in 100% participation in politics rather than the abstraction that only has about half of them participating or voting at all. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Baratunde, can you tell us about a Clinton, the Clinton Attacks Obama wiki that you were instrumental in creating? Sure can. Good. Um, in January, uh, once again through the Jack and Jill Politics site, which is a black political website, We've been writing about a lot of incidents that kind of got our attention. You know, Billy Shaheen uh, up in New Hampshire had referred to Barack Obama as a possible drug dealer. He said, oh, everybody's going to talk about, no, he, but the Republicans are going to bring this up. He wasn't bringing this up. He was just telling everybody <laughs> that the Republicans, he was being, a, he was helpful. He good was very helpful. A good neighbor. Good neighbor. But he went an extra step and he said, okay, the Republicans are going to ask him about his drug use and how much did he use and when did he use it and who did he sell it to and... A lot of us are like, what? Like, every, okay, presidents are people, people do drugs, that's not a huge leap, everybody gets all upset about it, it's stupid. But never has it been taken to the degree that the president is now a drug dealer. <laughs> right, that's extra entrepreneurial things that we don't assume about our presidents. And this was one of many incidents. Uh, we had gotten reports from people that we had on the ground in South Carolina about the nature of some of the ground operation down there and the sort of strong arm tactics they were using with black churches. And there started this buzz built among our commenters, et cetera, that said, there's some weird rape color arousal tactics going on. And other black bloggers were using this phrase, race baiting with color arousal tactics is actually more accurate. And at the same time, everybody else at the big media system was saying, you're making it up. You're wrong, you're not seeing it. It's black people being super sensitive again. Mm. And as anybody who has been oppressed knows, like, the only thing worse than the oppression is being told that it doesn't exist. Right? Because then someone's denying the validity of your experience. And you know firsthand what's going on and how it makes you feel. And I sat down after Bob Johnson, the head of BET, introduced Hillary Clinton at an event. He did more stupid things you can look up. But it put me over a line. And I was going to write a blog post, because that's my primary outlet. Video, I'm working on some video, but the words are still where it's at for me. And I was like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to help people see what's going on. It's all about leverage in my head. I'm like, what can I do that has the widest impact? So if I make a list, people can see that we're not crazy and that a lot of things are going on. So I actually started writing a blog post. I looked back over our archives and other websites and news reports, and I had like 10. And I thought, there's probably more. I can't do all this, and I can't do it in one night, staying up till 4 a.m. like most of my blog posts. So I said, wiki. Wiki's the way to get it done, because you've got this embedded base of people on the ground everywhere, watching TV stations, listening to the radio, reading news reports and blog reports. And I saw, used my Twitter network to say, which wiki software would be best for this? And they got back and said, PB wiki. So I, took out clintonattacksobama.pbwiki.com. And if you Google to this day, Clinton attacks Obama, that's the first result. And here's what I said, and I think this is important, when I set it up, because I never, you know, I was a strong proponent of Obama. I did not become like anti-Clinton, and I didn't want this to be an excuse for some open field of just broadside, baseless attacks. So I tried to set some rules for what we wanted to accomplish with this. And, and here's what I said. This is an experiment in community information gathering. Um, as a contributor for Jack and Joe Politics, I've seen the strong black community reaction to what many see as race-themed attacks against Obama by Bill, Hillary, and other members of her campaign. As folks have questioned the number and validity of these events, I thought I'd put together a place to keep track of them. Blog posts are not good places to keep a running list, and I'm too busy to do it all by myself. So like a multinational corporation, I'm outsourcing this bad boy. <laughs> this presidential campaign is unprecedented in its ability to have either an extremely constructive or uh, destructive conversation about race. I don't have much faith in America's ability to get it right, but this is my attempted contribution to more civil discourse. And then what we did was we set up a template 
so that you don't just randomly spew crap. You said, who said it? What was the date? What was the statement? What was the context? You know, were they in a, giving an introduction? Were they at a speech? Was it an offhand remark caught off you know, when they thought the mic was off? Um, what was the racialicious level? Right? <laughs> and there was like low, medium, and high ratings. So if this was just like low was, well, you can't really tell if you were predisposed to hate the person, then you're gonna say it's racist, but it's not obvious. Whereas high is like, that's just terrible. Like, come on now. And then what was the whackness level? Because some things are whack, but they're not racial. <laughs> <laughs> but they're still wrong. So I wanted this to grab those two. So this was not just about race. Um, links, we had a space to put links to press reports, etc. You could embed the YouTube video right in the wiki. Um, and then the latest status. Did the person issue an apology, a pseudo apology? They apologized for you getting offended about it. Did they get fired? Were they promoted? Uh, you know, did they, uh, did they get $3 million in consulting fees? So this is what we set out to do and it worked. In many ways it worked because one, it gave a simple address to send people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I was looking for as I was going out, you know, I'm, I'm involved in these conversations up here. So much of the blogosphere is like reaction to the media. They set this tone and we react, 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 react. But the stuff going on down here, A, is much more interesting and B, doesn't have a good mechanism for response. And I wanted to give somebody who had a friend who said, you're making this up or I don't see it, to be able to just send them one link mm -hmm. that says, check this out and tell me what you think. And I was able to use that a lot, but it, was a, it got bigger than what I wanted to do. And other people came to this resource and we had people editing the wiki, cleaning it up, changing some of the ratings, updating the status. So it, uh, we got on PRI, you know, Public Radio International, Wired did a post about it, and a lot of people blogged it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have up to 50 incidents in the tracker now. And so when you look back and say, well, what was the goal? Mm -hmm. Right, the goal was to have a place where we could have a list, a number, and context for all these things that one group of people were seeing that no one else was, or very few other people were acknowledging. And I think we accomplished a yeah. lot of that. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it also whet my appetite. Because mm -hmm. it, it's the jump where I realized as a blogger, and as a writer, as an editorial producer, that what we had created was well beyond that. Mm -hmm. That this was a tool. Right, this was a conversation, but mm -hmm. it was a tool for empowerment and for action beyond, hey, read my cool blog post and tell me how great you think it is. Mm -hmm. That's so like 0 0.5. Or how whack you are. Or how, well, I'm not whack, <laughs> but insert other blogger here. Um, and so we're looking at extending that sort of activism branch right. of what we're doing. Again, it's nice to, to say things that touch people, and that's a key element, but it's nicer to get people to do things. Right. And so whether it's showing up or voting or giving money or talking to their neighbors or collaboratively exploring an issue, we are looking at doing more things like that because it's, that's the change. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Jay, you want to respond to that? Yeah. Um, really good story. Um, I want to point out a few things that we're learning that are, um, that are implied in Baratundi's story. Um, first of all, Open systems, which is what uh, a wiki is, don't work like closed systems. Closed systems are different. They work one way, and open systems work another way. The people who have grown up as the masters of closed systems don't know how open systems work, and everything they think about them is wrong. So you need people who have grown up on the open platforms to try the stuff with the open systems because the people who have dominated the closed ones will always fuck it up. So secondly, uh, none of the systems that have run the campaign dialogue are optimized for participation. None of them. This includes the media. It includes the campaigns themselves, the people who are trying to win. Uh, it includes the parties. None of them are optimized for the participation made possible by the internet. And so you have to watch out for them not only resisting what we're talking about, that's one thing. You have to really watch out when they absorb it, when they accept it, because they're gonna try and absorb the participatory energy 
without really changing their closed system model. So you have to watch that. Uh, third, uh, when you think about the internet in politics, I have a simple three word formula, Andrew. Think audience atomization overcome. I'm going to say it again. Audience atomization overcome. That's what the internet makes possible in politics. And if you uh, understand how it works, you can see why it's so potent. Now, to get to your story. Um, this is an emerging model of information gathering where you have, and I'm going to describe it in my language, you have a charismatic contributor, writer, Baratunde, who has already an audience who has some visibility and is obsessed about certain things or becomes obsessed about certain things by watching exactly what we said, right? Here's, I'm trying to participate in this election as an intelligent citizen. I keep seeing these clowns on the media, screw it up. People are upset about it. I know other people share my feelings. And out of blogging, occasionally, these stories emerge that the media can't handle. And so there's um, a lot of people who are motivated to read what you write, to follow what you're doing, to come back day after day. And so you've, immediately you've solved one of the problems of participation, which is how do we motivate people to participate, right? We, we, are, we have the solution. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, Something happens that pisses people off. So now they're extra motivated. Right? Third, we have an information need. There's an information need. Your information need was, hey, how many of these incidents are there? Like, I know some, but I know you know a lot more, and nobody's going to tell us them all because they're all participating in this system. So there's an information need. And the fourth and most important element is they already have a shared narrative of the campaign that allows them to make sense of these incidents. Because even though you spelled out on the wiki, well, here's what we're looking for. We're not looking for just anything, right? We, and you tried to structure it. The only reason your structure could work is because all your participants have this shared narrative. And in fact, if you looked at these specifications you give them, they're only practical because you have people who, who come with this story. They're, they're frustrated by the same things. They're looking at the election at least in a, in a similar enough way that they don't have to be caught up. Right? And when you have those things together, the motivation, the charismatic contributor, the incident, the information need, and the shared narrative, the technology is a minor thing. It can be a comment thread. It can be the simplest wiki alive. It can be, it could be email. Because those are the things that's the human alignment, people towards the project. Those are the things that spell success, not tools and technologies. Even though tools and technologies are the things that are lowering the cost of participation and therefore are essential. It's these other things that make it possible. And that's why it wasn't that hard to get people to contribute, right? Yeah. You set up the system, they figure it out. And the part that you did at the end there, which is structuring it a little bit so that people aren't just giving you raw data, right? And they're not just giving you anything, but they have a form to fill out. They have a, they have a way to participate. That's actually the hardest part. That's mm. cutting the work up into these little pieces that they can do. And overcoming their atomization, right? And adding it all together to make one thing. And I think this is an emerging style of, uh, of citizen, pro-am, blog-driven, internet-born uh, mm -hmm. journalism mm -hmm. that I think will have significant implications as soon as we figure out how it works and, uh, and show that it can produce. Well, and it, and it can really go, do you want to respond to that yeah, yeah. There was one yeah, other, oh, no, no, it's fine, please go ahead. Okay. Really quick thing that jumped on, there's a tech media company out there called Red Lasso, which Huffington Post works with, it allows, they're basically a TiVo on steroids, they capture multiple video streams from the national and a lot of the local networks, and you can pinpoint the in and out points on a timeline and, and clip it, uh, and put it on your website. So it's kind of like YouTube, but it's much, much faster and more accurate. You know, you're all, you may have seen something, and you're like, I wanna grab that. 
YouTube, you can't really do that. You get, a, you get a 10 minutes and you only want 30 seconds, you get 35 and you're missing 38. And this is a similar situation where we had a lot of people writing in saying, oh, did you see MSNBC? Did you see what Stephanie Tubbs Jones said last night? And we set up another form <laughs> using a Google spreadsheet thing. Where it was like, what network, what time, who said it? Give me an exact quote because their search technology can pull that out. Uh, and we can decide, like, can we pull it or not? Right. Uh, and then the next step would be like, let them pull it and we edit it. And then the third step is just let them post it. Uh, on their own. On their yeah. own, yeah. yeah. But it's a very, you know, like, it's evolving to that. Yeah. I loved yeah. your breakdown of those pieces. That's though. the take up point right yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is such exciting, groundbreaking stuff that we're all hearing about. And it's possible in campaign mode, which is chaotic and a little bit free form. But Andrew, once, once a person gets to actual governance, and then you have real special interests with their chokehold on the system and their interest in making sure that uh, there isn't conversations about issues and, and the status quo is their best friend, do you envision a way to take these kinds of tools and energize citizens for participation in governance? Uh, absolutely. Um, so. Barack Obama will probably, if elected, have an email list of five to ten million people. That's his own special interest group. And he will be able to further his conversation with those, let's say, five million people who will also be having conversations with each other via tools like the one you just described. And he will be able to put them to work in order to get his agenda and legislation passed. And he'll start thinking about asking them for ideas because he'll actually believe that some of them have better ideas than any of the people that he might appoint to office. I mean, I don't think the president's really worried about all the potholes in America, but if the mayor of New York was smart enough, he'd simply ask everybody in New York to take digital pictures of all the potholes and post them on a site with Google Maps and we would all know where the potholes are right away. I mean, there isn't, a, there isn't a lot of belief on the part of politicians that the constituency that they serve are smarter than they are. Um, that's going to change. So uh, the people who don't realize this are the existing special interests who, as you mentioned, are going to try to hold on to power. Um, and, and as we've all witnessed in the last several decades, if not longer, it's usually a function of money. But the politician of the future, whether it's Barack Obama or his successor, is going to be powerful not based on how much money he has, but how powerful his network is, and how well connected the network is, and how capable the network is of being able to get the information distributed quickly. And when we're talking about quick, let me point out to you that we're about to enter the phase of the world live web. Uh, Nokia currently makes a little camera called the N95, which is a, actually it's a cell phone and a camera combined. It's got a five megapixel uh, chip in it and a, and a Zeiss lens and it's, uh, it looks like just any other, it looks like a digital camera and it also looks like a phone. Uh, what's interesting about it is, is that it, it, if you turn it on in video form, it actually streams live to the web. So Mayflower uh, uh, blogging at the, at the fundraiser in, um, in uh, San Francisco, instead of writing about it, she might have pulled out this device and it might have been live on the web. And then it's too late because it's out there already. It gets archived immediately just the same way as you would archive on YouTube. So ultimately, I think that this kind of dynamic is creating a natural byproduct of the internet, which is transparency. And politicians are going, to, and I think this is important to point out too, which is that the internet is the first organism that I know of that has a memory older than itself. And so politicians are going to start learning that it just makes a lot more sense to say the truth because when they try to parse what they thought they said or what they wanted to say in order to fit the current moment, someone finds what they actually said and publish it. So what we're going to, and, and, let, let's start, and then let's move on to data. You quickly mentioned the Sunlight Foundation, which I appreciate. But what, is that, what, is, what does transparency actually mean? Well, so everybody here knows what earmarks are for the most part. So we're, we're approaching a day, it's not quite there yet, but we're almost there, where you can publish the earmarks and match them with Google Maps. So you can see where, for example, all the two-lane highways to nowhere are being built. But then some earnest citizens, maybe some participants in assignment.net, 
will take that data and mash it with county property records so you can see who owns the property around those two lane highways to nowhere. And then some other erstwhile citizens, maybe people working for the Sunlight Foundations or other, other uh, good government groups, will take that data and mash it with the personal disclosure forms of senators and congressmen or the donor information of who's giving the money and we'll start seeing that they're actually earmarking money for themselves and their friends. All four pieces of data are benign by themselves. In fact, three pieces of data combined don't really tell a story, but four pieces of data tell a story that gets very, very compelling. This is the future that's coming, and the political system is oblivious to its arrival. So it's a very, very exciting time to be involved in technology and politics, and very, very exciting time to be involved in democracy. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Before we go to uh, questions, is there something, anything anybody on the panel is dying uh, to say uh, before we do that, Baratunde? I just want to say I'm really glad you talked about the data. I'm really, because it's one of the things, you know, looking at, and I hate to keep making this about Obama, but hey, I'm wearing the shirt. <laughs> Can't really hide it. One of the things that, you know, People say, well, what's the thing that you care about? Like, why do you care? What's different? That stands out as so different. You know, that government spending website, usaspending.gov, is live now. You can go see a lot of where federal money goes. And you see trend lines. You can start to piece together some of the story of how the country really works. And these mashups of, you know, doing this correlation thing that Andrew just talked about is going to freak people out. It's going to freak the citizens out first. Because we're going to realize just how badly we've been bamboozled. You know, because it's the, the control over that information is how people stay in power. Mm -hmm. And we're having access, you know, control over the means of communication, control over information, control over economic production, et cetera. But all those walls are crumbling and they're moving a lot faster. He's right about those years. So I'm just, I'm really just doubling down on what you just said because I'm ex so excited about it. And it's going to happen much faster than we think. That cell phone's live right now that he's talking about. The next one's going to be even better and cheaper. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. So let's get there already. Sure. Let's um, open this up a little bit. There was a little item in the Chicago Sun-Times this week by Lynn Sweet that said, it wasn't completely well sourced, but the gist of it was that the Obama campaign would begin opening fundraisers to the press which had always been closed. No, that's not really true, Jay. I actually researched that today and discovered that, that, that Gore, that we saw that story too, and actually Gore actually opened his fundraisers up to the press. What wasn't clear was what Obama's willing to do is actually list all his fundraisers. All right. Well, this, it points to something that's, to me, one of the big interesting question marks, which is how Obama, as the candidate of openness or the candidate who does get some of this stuff, is going to actually conduct himself? Mm -hmm. Will he actually conduct himself as a different candidate as a result of some of these things? I think, I don't know the answer to that yet. Mm -hmm. I think it's, but it's something that I'm watching because um, the whole era of presidential campaigning was built entirely on a one-to-many media system in which audience atomization was almost never overcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of the people who gained control of the campaign were experts in that system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fall of that class from control is going to be a nasty, brutal, terrible, ugly, and long process. And for the face of it, think Mark Penn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, well, when you think you know, I'm, of this I'm, group, just think. Mark Penn and his uh, fall and how ugly that was. I'm uh, going to excuse myself a little early out of this panel specifically because I'm going uptown to a, a fundraiser for Barack. He's in town. Well, tell him to say what's up. I'll say what's up. <laughs> tell him to give me a call. So I'm going to work my Tell him what I'm watching. Tell him I'm watching. Um, but the reason I'm, I'm really interested in going is because I, I, uh, I've met him before and I want to encourage him to take a major step which I think will fundamentally change politics in this country forever regardless of whether or not he becomes president which is to limit donations from here on out for the rest of the election cycle to $250 and challenge McCain to do the same thing and turn it into a people-financed election as opposed to a federally-financed election. 
and force the political system to deal with the fact that small donations is a better way for the country to go. Mm -hmm. He can do it. 90% of his donations currently are below $90. He has the potential of raising half a billion dollars for the general election on small donations. And it's just a matter of flipping a switch. We are reaching a tipping point in politics where this could actually happen. So uh, it, it, it does matter. I'll just tell you one other quick story just to sort of emphasize this point. About a, three weeks ago, I was asked to do a, a presentation in Washington to 500 web content managers that work for the federal government. These are the web, the web content masters for the IRS, the FDA, the FDIC, the TCA, the Homeland Security Department, the Labor Department, 500 of them. And uh, first of all, you should just know that they're very frustrated because they're not allowed to use YouTube videos and embed them on any of their sites because the federal government's not allowed to be subservient to a state law and YouTube in terms of service is a state-driven uh, a state, a state driven terms of service. Um, but I asked all 500 of them, of the three candidates remaining, which ones, who thought that their jobs were going to be easier if John McCain was president? No one raised their hand. And how many thought their job was going to be easier if Hillary Clinton became president? And three or four people raised their hands. And then I asked the same question about Barack, and the entire audience raised their hand. Mm -hmm. These are nonpartisan, nonpolitical appointees working for the federal government. Something's up. So he's got the bureaucrat vote. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Well, Godspeed, Andrew. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Are you scooting right now? No, I got a few more minutes. I okay. we'll get some questions, well, and I'll go. Yeah. Shoot. Why don't we uh, take some questions? Uh, Susan, do you have a, a, a microphone, or people just? Can... Yeah, we can just stand oh, up. Oh, the oh line. you can stand up and, and ask your question then. You standing, yes. ask your question. I think, Clay, I think it's because we want to record everyone's voice. That's that's fine. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that I think that all of you are heroes. And if there was some kind of order, you'd be getting like one of the, with the badges to walk around with it the rest of your lives. So How about thank a check? <laughs> that doesn't bounce. It's the, <laughs> um, I, I want to point out something that, that I find very interesting. I work for Democracy in Action, which is a, a vendor of um, advocacy tools for progressive organizations. Uh, collectively, we've got 15 million donors on our system. There's hundreds of organizations and just, just super activists who probably have a few tens of thousands. I find it fascinating that very few organizations are choosing to uh, find a way to make their donors and activists the ones in charge of the agenda. Uh, and I'm also fascinated that tens of thousands of leaders are willing to be herded by people from some other part of the country who send them instructions via email. And I'm sort of torn between how is it that even in a very educated, very progressive, very, uh, very democratic, relatively speaking, space, we're still not seeing people say, I'm going to be part of an organization where my vote counts, mm -hmm. where they ask me what we should do and show me how that's counted and give me a report about the influence I have in that organization at the end of the year. Are these nonprofit organizations? All nonprofit organizations. Yeah, I need to take this one, guys. I'm and sorry. It, it's, <laughs> it, and I, just one last thing. I, I, I volunteer for Move On as well, and yeah. I notice as well, amazing tools. They have chosen not to develop the kinds of tools yeah. that would make what they do accountable to their own members That's and donors. Right. Yeah. Oh, you go, Andrew. Well, I just want to, I, yeah. I want to just because just you mentioned Move On. When I mentioned the two schools in the use of technology and politics earlier, Move On is a perfect example of an organization that follows the top down school of politics in the, in the internet, which is that there's a few people who set the agenda, they will email their list, they will sort of tell them what they want to do, and people have delegated their public their opinions to move on to, to, for the most part. They may ask them to vote on a primary, so they're supporting Barack mm -hmm. Obama in this particular case, but they don't, they don't want to introduce their members to each other because then they lose their political power and they get all their political power in Washington because they say, in, they walk into a meeting and they say, we've got an eight million person email list, you better pay attention to us. But nobody in those meetings ever asks them, how many people actually open your emails? Because <laughs> nobody even knows to ask that question. For Move On, I get it. I know who they are and I get it. I, and I'm not confused about why that happens with them. But I am confused about all of these hundreds of other organizations yeah. that are not making well, a difference. Please, here's, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. So here's, here's the problem, is that we have a nonprofit sector that exploded in the second half of the 20th century and the people who run those organizations were, were taught to run them as top-down hierarchies 
where a small group of professional staff are in charge and donors are considered um, walking ATM machines. We only talk to them because we need money. And so the people who are responding in the way that you're saying, you know, just give us a check or do what we tell you to do, grew up in that same system. Now millennials didn't grow up that way. They're not running organizations that way. Take somebody like Mobilize.org or Genocide Intervention Network. They have very flat organizations. Uh, they do a much better job of listening as organizations. So some of that is going to change. And some of the organizations that you're talking about, they'll continue because nonprofits don't readily die, but they'll become dinosaurs. You know, those direct mail donor bases now average close to 70 years old in a lot of those big organizations. So change or die. Um, but these are these old habits. And when you look at graduate school curricula now, I went to Wagner down the street here. Uh, it, it, it really is geared towards um, a very for-profit model that does not work in the nonprofit sector. We are told over and over, particularly by funders, to behave in a more business-like way. Build metrics like businesses, right? And it doesn't work. And until we recognize that we need models, methods, metrics that fit our mission as nonprofits, traditional organizations aren't going to change. I'm happy to talk to you more about that later. OK. Clay, I know you've been waiting back there. Sure. Yeah, I have a question actually for everybody, but with a specific uh, data point for, for Baratunde. And it's about motivation, right? We're in a world now where the normal, normal bit of media is produced outside any financial system. Uh, but if you go to the Clinton attacks Obama wiki, the last entries on May 7th, which I think we all know is hardworking white people Memorial Day, right? And <laughs> she hasn't stopped attacking Obama since that day. So. Clearly, something ended with, like, did the whackness meter break? I mean, what, <laughs> what, what happened when she made that comment that made the air kind of go out of the, the participatory effort? You know, the, um, that's a good question. It is, and I've thought about it a bit. And I think it comes back to what Jay was saying, that the motivation and the spark, you know, this was a community-driven thing, but also we at the blog were driving it. You know, there, were, there was a little bit of management. So like if someone, we, a lot of those incidents continued in the intervening months too. And the wiki doesn't capture everything. A lot of them were logged in the comments of blog sites and in conversations around kitchen tables across this country. And we kind of stopped. I know personally, I got tired. <laughs> really, because the point had been made. Mm. It, I mean, when, you, when we reached mm. 40, I'm like, I get it. <laughs> you know, 48, okay, great. And then even the May 7th thing, we just added that last week. And we didn't do it on May 7th. One of our writers was like, you know, let me go ahead and update this thing. We got to get, you know, hardworking white people day in. Um, I, I, that's great. I'm going to use that, by the way. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if the RFK comment's in there or not. I don't think it is. That, that was just, you know, very recently. But I think, it, A, we had a critical mass. And a lot of what we set out to do was accomplished. B, a lot of the primary drivers stopped driving. And C, here's something sort of technical. We didn't have a, an incentive system associated with it. We didn't have a highly visible input into it. You know, we've created this little block, a graphic image basically in the left column of our blog that says Clinton attacks Obama. It didn't say, it didn't call to action though. It didn't say like, here's the count. It didn't say last updated. It didn't preview or tease the most recent incident. So the massive traffic who get to the front page of the blog was not really aware of what was going. You had to go in, click to the incident tracker, scroll to the bottom. So there was a lot of work that we took on that we didn't quite hand over to the community as well. And I think all those contributed to us just sort of petering out. Go ahead, sure, go ahead. Um, we found, uh, Clay, and also to go back to your question, the earlier question, um, that the optimal mix is not top down or bottom up. It's not um, personality driven or crowd driven. But it's this combination of both around fortuitous events. So it's those three things. It's bottom up energy top-down organizing or uh, opportunism with some sort of, of a mobilizing event. 
And when one or two or three of those things, if any of them drop out, then the project kind of dies, right? And you can't, you, can't, you can't necessarily call it one or the other. And so, so one of the reasons why people don't participate is that some people are in the market, as it were, for, for low participation involvement. And if you provide an easy way for them to participate with only a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, they will. Other people are looking for kind of medium <laughs> you know, involvement, like weekly check-in or something. And then there's a few, a very few, that are interested in very intensive involvement. And if your project doesn't anticipate different levels of motivation and time like that, then you're not actually maximizing participation because it's not any one of those things. It's a mix. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, my name is Michael Rand, and I'm a just graduated MBA student. And from that perspective, one of the courses, for example, I just took was uh, marketing research. I was wondering, so far, in certain ways, it sounds like you've been talking about things as if we sort of have one bunch of people that are all sort of the same, you know, the web savvy types, and they're all doing their thing. And I was wondering if you could perhaps break that down and tell us some stories, if you know of them, um, in terms of, for example, region. For example, it is a lot of the people that are doing the organizing you're talking about, are they from New York? Are they from mm -hmm. California and Silicon mm -hmm. Valley? You know, where do they come from in mm -hmm. specific spots? Has the fact that Obama's been involved energized the black technological liter or vi video literate, as you said, to um, you know get involved in a way that they weren't before? Um, so geography and then also mm -hmm. ethnicity, mm -hmm. um, since we are a multi-ethnic environment here in America, and I was just curious how that part of it breaks down as well. Andrew, do you want to take geography? Uh, you know, I, 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 it's, I can't really answer the question because what I've seen is simply uh, more of a generational shift and, and a digital divide between millennials and, and baby boomers and those older who, um, who are just learning about these tools. And, um, and so in, in some, for example, in Vermont or in some remote areas, you have a lot of people who are online because it's, they've discovered it's a lifeline. Um, but they use it primarily for information gathering. They haven't really necessarily participated in the social web as we've seen it. And so we see we, there's a couple of different digital divides. You know, there's the the standard digital divide, which is the the fact that you know working class people can't afford five hundred or six hundred dollars a year to pay Time Warner or Verizon for broadband service, which is a tragedy uh, in our society. Then you have a uh, skills d d digital divide because some people know how to use email and they know how to maybe watch a YouTube video but they don't necessarily know how to participate in a wiki and they don't understand the culture of a wiki and then there's a whole other community of people who are Twitterers and uh, videographers and video bloggers and, and others who are constantly absorbing new tools and figuring out new ways to use them so it's it's sort of all over the place um, um, so I can't I can't really answer on a geographic but I can tell you that there's there's uh, clearly segments that you can look at through the landscape where some people are more savvy than others. Is it mostly men or women? Uh, it's actually split pretty evenly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Baratunde? On the, uh, I'll take the racial question. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Only because it was directed. No, I know. I'll take just it if it was directed silly. at me. Um, I would say, you know, my own story is, is from the very core of like the Digirati. Yeah, I got online in, in 1993 using Lynx and Linux. I hacked my way through the university, through the public library gopher system to use <laughs> Telnet to check my email with Pine. And I use Twitter and I love it. So part of what has been fun for me is the overlapping spheres in a project like this and in, you know, in a community like Jack and Jill, where most of our community is not the tech digerati. You know, they don't go to South by Southwest Interactive and they don't play with wikis all the time. And so I've loved being able to, in some way, like be an ambassador for that and try to apply those tools to something that this other group of people that I'm also part of really cares about. And I can, you know, one of the sort of the, the literacy points, commenting on Blogger was like really not intuitive for a bunch of people that we had a lot of anonymous commenters because folks didn't understand what is open ID, why is that there? You know, there's no, no one explains what this is. So I recorded a video screencast and put that up there, like how to comment. And our anonymous commenters are now like a vast minority. Most people just registered. And because they want to know, because it helps with conversation, 
to respond to a person's name as opposed to anonymous at 3.15 p.m. So that was one thing. As far as the community in general of kind of black folk online doing this political participation stuff, I am overwhelmed with excitement about what I'm seeing. Because we've had, we have this group of folks, you know, the Afrosphere is somewhat of the self-branded name. And there are email back channels and some coordinated efforts. You've got groups like Color of Change, led by James Rucker and uh, Van Jones of the Ella Baker Center. James worked at Move On. And Color of Change is somewhat of like a, a people of color move on. And they, the big flare up was over CBC Fox debates. And we got that stopped. Mm -hmm. When the Congressional Black Caucus wanted to do a, a debate series with Fox, the enemy of black people, mm -hmm. you know? Like, <laughs> really? You got elected again and again to do stupid things like this? And, uh, and the Gina Six situation. And so you see that evolving now to accountability among Congressional Black Caucus members. And I, so it's coming. Everything's changing really fast. I agree on the generational split. Mm -hmm. As far as the, the, um, the gender split, we, I also see a very even. On our own blog, we have three women uh, writers, two men writers, probably add another man shortly. But our commenters are also evenly split as well, it seems. Can I add something on that sure. real quick? Um, uh, in the media world, the media elite has benefited enormously by the influx of tech, people from the tech world, um, because they have a more participatory um, mentality. Also, one thing I've noticed in geographic terms is that people from the Silicon Valley and from the Bay Area have a totally different attitude about failure compared to people in New York. <laughs> and there's been, I think, a big awakening <laughs> uh, that their attitude is a lot better than our attitude. And I've benefited myself just from, from that attitude, which I think is really important for the kind of work that we're doing here. Oh, we're going to say goodbye to Andrew. Thank you for participating. Thank say you. hello to Barack for us. I think, uh, Jed, you've been standing for a while. Um, a friend of mine said the other day, ha was laughing at the idea that Chelsea Clinton, during a campaign event, said, well, if you want the unfiltered view, if you want, if you want a, the view unfiltered by anything, go to my mom's website and you can read about the issues there. Uh-oh. And, and it, it just happened to be Chelsea Clinton, you know, and it just happened to be Hillary, but it, it could be really, it's the kind of thing that any, almost any candidate might say. And I'm wondering, with a vast amount of information everywhere, videos that get taken instantly, I'm being videoed right now, presence, or what Jay was talking about, about how going into a traditionally non-news space, extending the news space. So we're present in much more places and we leverage each other's presence differently because we're, we're no longer quite as atomized because we're in a group. But are we or aren't we still stuck in, stuck in silos a little bit uh, when it comes to that I'm not a believer in that echo chamber thing. I agree with David, not with uh, Amy Harmon, not with Sunstein. But uh, how would you know what was true or not in that situation? Where would you go if you're not going to dig into Wikipedia, become a, one of those top percent, the small percentage of people who dig and dig and dig and then everyone else benefits because of what they've posted? How would the average internet user at that middle threshold or lower look besides in somewhat siloed places. You could find out a lot about Hillary's positions on the Obama website or on the McCain website um, or on the Terry McAuliffe website if there was one. But where would you go if you wanted a more integrated, synthesized view or how quickly could you, if you weren't a high, high power user, get that information yourself or are we not there yet? Mm -hmm. What do you think, Jay? Um, I think that a lot of our ideas about how other people operate have themselves been shaped by the media. And one of the most important things going on is that this mental image we have of, of uh, the Clinton campaign calls them low information voters, <laughs> which I think is just an amazing phrase, like incredible piece of language. Um, but I don't, I don't think they necessarily behave the way educated people fear it or imagine. And this silo criticism is one, is an example of that. It's true that it's easier than ever for people to find other people of like mind. And 
to commune with those people. And because it's easier than ever to do that, we look at that and say, that's all people are going to do. But in fact, when you look at how real people actually behave, instead of these stick figures that we use to argue about the internet with, the way real people behave is they go to those places and then they also participate in these more horizontal systems like forwarding emails right, that bust up the silo and move information around in a horizontal way that isn't what was necessarily intended by the makers of silos and spaces. So as the volume, as the, the sheer flood of information and stuff increases, right behind that come new ways of organizing that and distributing it and, and sifting and filtering it. And you have to look at both at the same time because that's how the internet progresses. So what is a blogger? What is a good blogger? A blogger originally and today, a really good blogger is somebody who sifts the internet and sifts it from a wide variety of places. That's what the original first bloggers did and that's what a good blogger still does now. If you need a blogger, you need him to sift for you. And so people find ways of reducing the flood at the same time that the flood keeps uh, expanding and that's how the internet grows. And you can't just take one part of that and look at it in isolation. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add to that? Really quick add on. A lot of what is necessary for someone in that situation is a trusted source. Right? You're going to get an email over here saying Obama kicked a puppy in the face. And you're going to get an email over here saying, no, he kicked a cat in the face. And one of those is true. <laughs> right? <laughs> but you know, in, ideally, that is what our established media organizations do, right? That, that they help, they see a lot of this noise and they help with that synthesis. They're trained after all. They've been doing this for years and they're not all bad. A lot of them do really try to do it. And you have other independent voices doing it as well. It comes down, I think, often to the individual. What will they believe? What are they predisposed to dismiss anyway? But I think we do have some role in the online production of media for that curation for those trusted voices and facilitators and th synthesizers to emerge. Um, and we have a lot, I think the production is ahead of that synthesis in some ways. Mm -hmm. Terrific. So you're both sort of saying that propagation and churn, the more churn, the more bandwidth, the more activity, the closer we can get to something that's truer. You know, I'm going to, uh, thanks, and you can continue at the reception. We have a couple of other folks. Yeah. Hi, uh, unrelated. First, I imagine you're sure to say Barack the Casbah. I'm sorry, what? Barack the Casbah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this goes to the ghost, ghost of Andrew right now and to you on the double down Baratunde, which is the value of the mashup as a medium, as a transparency creator. If the Constitution, just good old paper, recognize that people are going to do dirt regardless, and so we need to build systems that will recognize that and you'll never be able to defeat it, but you at least have a strong system, meeting a strong system. Then two questions. What do you see as the viable window of a mashup creating that value for activism? Meaning I see the land, I know the owner, I see the, the earmark, and I put it all together and pow. And so that's, uh, there's only a small window where that would be, well, I, don't, I don't want to say how big or small it is. There's a window where that's going to be valuable and then systems adapt uh, to, you know, uh, to combat that. Meaning for information purposes, yeah, mashups is going to be great. But as soon as you start trying to reveal things of consequence other than just for my own personal information, you have an adaptation virus-like. And so I wonder what you see now and what you imagine as adaptive systems for this transparency. I think in, uh, that's, a, that's a really complicated question, actually. <laughs> and I think I understand what you're saying, but I... Yes, we'll have this open window where people are discovering new ways to, to reveal some of these hidden truths and some of the, the correlation of just in the data example. And then the power structure will adapt and try to shut that down. However, we also have rules. And those rules can help set some boundaries of acceptable behavior. You know, before the Freedom of Information Act, we had nothing. Now that, that act is there. And that creates a somewhat immovable something. 
Now there's been some pushback against that. You can declare things national security and get them taken out of that protected realm. But things were never the same pre-FOIA, post-FOIA. And I think if we have rules of what happens to government information, that they must be you know, in a open searchable data format, that they have to be produced within a certain window and made available to the public within a period of time so you don't have 20-year-old documents being faxed to people you know, 10 years from now. I'm like, good luck, sucker. Like, so we can avoid some of that. <clears throat> That's the key part, and I think when you get to these issues of kind of network neutrality and issue, those are the battles that are super important. Because mm -hmm. the battle over this mashup or that mashup doesn't matter, but the rules of the road that allow those activities to happen are. And if we get those wrong, then I think we have, you know, or we miss an opportunity to set good ones, mm -hmm. then we're in danger. I, I agree with that. Also, uh, net neutrality is the one to watch uh, for the adaptation, but also, I've learned something else in doing these projects, which is as soon as you have a new capacity, you bring it online, people can now do this. One of the first things that happens is a whole bunch of people dream up every bad thing that could happen and throw it at those who are sort of celebrating the new. And what I've learned is that if you allow those fears to be your horizon, you can't get anything done. And so you have to listen to what they said because everything they are saying is actually very important. It's a potential danger. It's a risk. But you can't use that to actually plan what you're going to do because the human mind is extremely fertile in coming up with wacky things that people can do with the new freedoms they've been given. And only some of them will actually develop into problems. And so you can't make decisions based on your fear of how somebody is going to react or based on, on people's projections. You have to look at actual behavior and <coughs> then solve the problems that arise from actual behavior. Mm -hmm. We're going to take one last question and then we have a lovely reception set up here in the back. The, the, the usually nice stuff between the food and you better talk fast. Make it good. <laughs> yeah. Run you over. Make it so, good. I'm, I'm Veni Markovsky. I am ch member of the board of the ISOC New York chapter and chairing the Bulgarian Internet Society as well. And um, a former colleague of Susan uh, at the ICANN board. I have actually, I had a question for Andrew, but I hope you can also kind of uh, hint a little bit about it. Uh, he was talking about the five million people who uh, Barack Obama has in his database and the people who donate small amounts of money, like 90% up to whatever dollars. Uh, what is, what are the, ch do you have any idea what is the geographical distribution? Because living in New York, uh, and my wife is from the States, uh, she said, you don't know the US because you live in New York and you actually live in Manhattan, so that's even worse. <laughs> And then I went at some point to Texas and I realized I really don't know the U.S. Uh, quite a lot. So I'm a little bit worried. And, uh, you know, I'm, no wonder I'm a kind of fan of the Democrats here. But uh, I'm a little bit worried that these 5 million or even 10 million people are kind of East Coast, West Coast. And that is scary because the last couple of elections were decided not on the East and the West Coast. Mm -hmm. This is one question. And then the second one was actually for Susan because she was... She gave this uh, welcoming note, and then she's sitting there having fun, not speaking. Uh, what is the, do you have any idea about the one web day in the next, uh, let's say, five years, which in internet terms is long term? What is your goal like to have in five years? Do you want to cover the whole world, or do you want to actually have like one, 365 or maybe 366, I can't calculate quickly? in five years, uh, days, one web days all over the, the world. Let me I'll quickly tell you the Barack answer and then I want to leave Susan with time to respond. Um, uh, the phenomenon of, of the Barack uh, Obama campaign has been its spread, has been that it's not bi-coastal. And although there, there are many donors who are in New York and, and Hollywood say, the phenomenon is the number of people participating, not just as donors, but as the door knockers, as Burundi uh, has, has been, and uh, bloggers and other participants uh, across the country, and in places, take a, uh, a Wyoming and a Texas uh, that have not been friendly uh, for other Democrats in a long time. And that's what the phenomenon is about. I'll let you respond on that. 
One web day. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question. And thanks to the Information Law Institute for having us and for Allison for hosting this. We make progress on difficult subjects when we can see them, when things are visible. We're making progress, I think, on politics in America because we're seeing a lot more information and able to talk to each other across old boundaries, not just listening to broadcast media stories, perhaps creating the news ourselves with a little bit of guidance from a structured wiki. It's important that that wiki was structured so the people were able to generate good data from what they were seeing. My goal for One Web Day is to make the people around the world who care about the future of the internet visible to themselves uh, across all boundaries. We now only think of ourselves almost as looking at a broadcast medium. That's not what the internet is. It is not made out of machines. It's actually made out of people communicating with each other. So my goal is to have it, like Earth Day, be a day of good works, consciousness raising, public events all over the world. Thank you all for coming, and thank you very much to our panelists. Just if you didn't catch that, the internet is soiling green.